Hi, everyone, and welcome to today's episode of Species Shorts. My name is Lindsay Barone, for those of you who are tuning in for the very first time. And today, we are going to be focusing on a group of Australopithecines, sometimes referred to collectively as the robust Australopithecines. And in particular, we are going to be focusing on this species you see right here. So this guy in my hands here is a species called Paranthropus ethiopicus. And a, a couple of classes ago, someone in the chat asked why the names of these species are the way they are. Um, and we responded that one of the ways that people name the fossils is based on where they're found. And so this skull that you're looking at right here um, is representative of a species that is primarily found in Ethiopia and Kenya. Um, so that's where that species name of Ethiopicus comes from. Now, before we talk about this species in any real detail, I want you all to have a chance to look at it up close. Um, so let's just take a, a good look at the face here. And you can kind of notice it's got these really big features, um, or we sometimes might describe them as robust features. That's where that robust Australopithecine name comes in. Um, you can see from the side how much this face slopes out. So that's that facial prognathism that we talked about in the Australopithecus afarensis episode. This is what it looks like from the back. Um, and we're gonna talk a lot about this bony feature you see up here that looks kind of like a mohawk. And then of course, this is the underside. Um, and you'll notice this is the front, this is the back. Um, you'll notice some of the features that we talked about with respect to the Australopithecines. Um, and in particular, having a more um, forwardly located frame and magnum and having those parallel teeth. So, um, what do we know about Paranthropus ethiopicus as a species? Um, well, first of all, like I said before, it's been exclusively found in East Africa. So Ethiopia and Kenya are the two sites where we normally find this species. Um, this particular species looks like it lived between 2.7 and 2.3 million years ago. Um, so this is particularly notable because our genus, the genus Homo, seems to appear in the fossil record at about 2.5 million years ago. So there's some overlap between the robust Australopithecines and the genus Homo coexisting in Eastern Africa. Now, this particular skull is given the nickname the Black Skull, which, you know, makes sense. Look at how, how dark it is. Um, this is actually the color it was that came, when it came out of the ground. Um, so a lot of times in the fossilization process, um, the fossils will, oops, sorry, almost dropped the skull there. Um, the fossils will actually take on the color of the ground that they're found in. Um, so this skull in particular um, is stained by manganese. So it has this really dark color um, because of where it was found. Um, in terms of some notable anatomical features, um, just like we saw with Australopithecus afarensis, um, it's got a pretty small brain. Um, you can kind of see here, and actually I've got afarensis here. Um, overall, the brains are about the same size. Um, Paranthropus ethiopicus has a brain that's about 410 cubic centimeters, which is right around what Australopithecus afarensis is as well. Um, so roughly a third of a modern human brain size. Um, you'll also notice that this guy has a really broad, thick face. Um, so you've got all of this thick bone in here. Um, you've got these really thick brow ridges. Um, one of the things you might notice too, and maybe you noticed when I held it up, these are the cheekbones, the zygomatic arches. Um, so you've got some in your face too, you can kind of feel them if you want. Um, there's a lot of space that goes between the zygomatic arches and the rest of the skull. Now that space 
is because there needs to be room for a very important, very large muscle to attach. Um, and that muscle in particular is the temporalis muscle. Now the temporalis muscle is a muscle that we have as well, um, but it's a muscle that runs basically from the top of our head down to our jaws, and it helps us chew. Paranthropus ethiopicus has a really large temporalis muscle. You may be wondering how exactly we know this because muscles don't tend to preserve in the fossil record, um, but we know this because of the areas of the bone where it attaches. And in particular, it attaches to this very large sagittal crest. So the sagittal crest is this thing that you see running from front to back on the top of the skull. Um, you can feel your own skull. You'll notice that running front to back right along that midline, you don't have anything like this. And in fact, this is a feature that among the hominins, we really only see so prominently in the genus Paranthropus. So this is one of those features that sets these guys apart from the rest of the hominins. Now this sagittal crest allows the temporalis muscle to be really big because it's so big, it goes up so far from the skull that gives a lot of attachment area for a very big, very important muscle. So it would run basically down here underneath the cheekbone, and then if we had the mandible, it would basically attach to the mandible and the maxilla, and it would help these guys chew. Now, because they have these big muscles, um, they're able to have a more powerful bite. They're able to chew a little bit tougher material. Um, that's also reflected in their teeth. And unfortunately, this guy doesn't have many teeth at all. It's really kind of hard to see. Um, but one of the very common features that we see in the robust Australopithecines is really large molars. Um, so your molars are your back teeth. Um, and you could kind of see a little bit here, got a, a big molar there. Um, but your molars, these big, thick molars with big, thick enamel, are good for grinding up really tough material, especially because they have this really big, strong temporalis muscle. Now, something that's also very interesting about their teeth, um, and I bet you guys have probably never spent that much time thinking about teeth before, but anthropologists love to talk about teeth. Um, one of the things that's very interesting about their teeth, especially can compared to the Australopithecus teeth, um, is that these teeth tend to be a little bit more specialized. So they've got molars, they've got these big teeth that are really very specifically adapted for eating really tough material. By contrast, the teeth on this guy, so this is Australopithecus afarensis, they're a little bit more generalized. Why does this matter? Well, if you have more generalized dentition, so if you've got teeth that are a little bit better at being flexible in what you eat, that means you're going to be able to make more use of more different kinds of food sources. So if the environment is changing, if one food source becomes depleted, you might be able to survive a little bit longer um, if you have teeth that allow you to eat a lot of different food sources. Um, by contrast, these guys have really specifically adapted teeth, and that may have ultimately led to their demise, um, because really they were around for a, a lot shorter of a time period than Australopithecus afarensis. Um, so that's one hypothesis as to why they go extinct relatively quickly compared to some of the other Australopithecines. Something else you might have noticed when you were looking at this skull is that you've got this really big face, you've got the snout area that sticks out pretty far from the bottom of the face. Um, so this is, again, that, that facial prognathism that we talked about on Monday. But it's also got what we sometimes describe as a dish-shaped face. So it kind of goes inward. 
Um, it's a little bit concave. And that's something that we see not only in Paranthropus, uh, Ethiopicus, but we also see it in Paranthropus boisei and Paranthropus robustus, the two other members of this genus. Now, I used the terms in the beginning, gracile and robust, to talk about the Australopithecines as a group. So this guy right here, this is Ethiopicus, Paranth is a member of the genus Paranthropus. This is sometimes referred to as a robust Australopithecine. Members of the genus Australopithecus, however, are referred to sometimes as the gracile Australopithecines. So the words gracile and robust are really just descriptors, basically saying that Australopithecus tends to be a little bit smaller, a little bit more delicate in its facial features and its skeletal features, whereas the genus Paranthropus tends to have these big, huge, bony faces. These distinctions were initially made because for a very long time, Australopithecus species and Paranthropus species were classified all in the genus Australopithecus. But to separate them out, they would put the ones that are now members of the genus, or, uh, the genus uh, Paranthropus under this heading of robust Australopithecine, and all of the other ones would become gracile Australopithecines. Um, ultimately, though, they were reclassified given their own genus. And from what it looks like, what we know now of the fossil record for the hominins, it's likely that no members of the genus Paranthropus have any living descendants. So essentially, the hypothesis is that rather than the robust Australopithecines ultimately contributing to the genus Homo, it likely comes through the gracile Australopithecine lineage. Um, so we've only talked about Australopithecus afarensis, but in fact, there are many other species that belong to the genus Australopithecus. And it's ultimately the genus Australopithecus that gives rise to the genus Homo. Now, we're going to start talking about the genus Homo on Friday. So I hope you'll all tune in for that discussion. If you have any questions at all on the Australopithecines, please put them in the comments on this video and I'll be happy to respond to them. Otherwise, have a wonderful day, and I will see you all on Friday.